Last but not least, let's talk about rule instantiation. You may remember that way back uh, when we introduced our first grounding algorithms, we always picked a ready-made ground rule from the ground instantiation of a logic program and always abstracted from the actual production of such a ground rule. And this is actually what we will be looking at now. Interestingly, the instantiation of a single ground rule amounts to solving a constraint satisfaction problem. So for each variable, you have to pick an element from a domain and then uh, in the body, notably the positive body literals, they can be seen as constraints uh, from which you pick valid combinations. Okay, anyway, so let's get started and get into the first concepts that we need for this. The concept of a safe body order allows us to exploit the notion of safety for rule instantiation. Now keep in mind that a rule is safe if all its variables occur within the positive body literals. Now within the scope of grounding or more or less the component-wise grounding we have been seen in the previous sections, the idea is that more or less you ground component-wise and when you ground the rules within a component then all the predicates of the positive body literals have been grounded before. So more or less if you then take the positive body literals you can get the instantiations for the variables by looking at the atom base that you have just built by grounding all the previous components. That's the idea. Okay, but now within a body, you may have an arbitrary ordering, right? Because again, in ASP, the idea is you're declarative, you don't care about the order of the rules, and you don't care about the order of the body literals. But when it comes to grounding, they have to be ordered so that you get the instantiations. And that's why we need the concept of a safe body order. A safe body order makes sure that each variable occurs first in a positive body literal before it is then used uh, in a negative one or in a comparison. Because in this way, it, the variable gets first its instantiation by instantiating the positive body literal and then it is, it, is, it is more as propagated to the negative ones or the comparisons. Anyway, mathematically this is uh, captured as follows. So we start from a body with and B1 to Bn are its body literals, positive, negative ones, comparisons, right? And then we put them in order so that each prefix of this order is itself safe. That is, whenever we take a prefix that goes from B1 to Bi, this guy has to be safe as well. And then actually grounding proceeds along such a, a safe body order, starting with the very first necessarily positive body literal and instantiates this, binds the variables and then continues from the left to the right. Okay, let's look at an example. For this, let's just reconsider the integrity constraint that all nodes must be reachable from our Hamilton cycle example. So anyway, this is the integrity constraint here and keep in mind uh, this is a rule, so the body is regarded as a set, but now we want to take this, uh, this set and put it into a sequence such that each pre prefix is also a safe set. Okay, good. So we have two candidates because we have just two body literals. In the first one we put the positive body literal first and then the second one. And this is actually a safe body order because if we look at the prefix uh, where we just take the first literal, this is safe, and then when we take both of them, this is safe as well, because in both cases, x appears in the positive body literal. When we reverse them, this does not give us a safe uh, body order, because here, even though both of them, or, or the, whole, um, the whole set of body literals is safe, because x appears in this positive body literal, the prefix where we only take the negative one is not safe, because here x does not appear in a positive body literal. Okay, so I hope this got the intuition. Now let's proceed to the second important concept for grounding. Now just as a logic program is grounded by grounding one subprogram after another, we instantiate now non-ground rules by proceeding along the safe body order and instantiating one body literal after another by following this order. So keep in mind that instantiation works or is driven by the positive body literals, right? So these are non-ground uh, atoms. And now to instantiate them, we more or less look at counterparts, atoms that have the same predicate symbol that are in the atom base. Now keep in mind the atom base contains ground atoms, ground, ground atoms, and now we have a non-ground 
whatever this means, a non-ground atom at our hand where we have to instantiate the variables. So to this end, we can do this by looking for a unifier, a substitution that replaces all the variables that we have here so that we get the same atom. Okay? And this is called a match. And in case you're not familiar with this, look at Wikipedia or take a sneak preview or look at the footnote. In a way, the footnote only makes precise what I wanted to indicate with my hand and the other hand with the fingers open, right? So a match is a substitution that replaces all the variables in a non-ground atom so that once the variables are replaced by ground terms, you get an atom that is the same as another atom. So this is actually, this here is A, this here is B, and the substitution replaces the variables here, the fingers, so that once replaced, both atoms are identical. Okay, well, anyway, if you didn't like this exp uh, explanation, uh, Wikipedia is pretty good on these guys. Also, it will tell you that matching is also regarded as one-sided unification. So just for those of you who have heard about unification and one-sided unification, but not about matching. Okay, now let's zip it uh, and close this footnote again and actually see how we use these matches in our context. More precisely, we use this function match that gives us for each body literal B the set of all matches in the current atom base. So sigma here is the ground substitution. It has gathered the instantiations we made so far. So because keep in mind, we are instantiating body literal B and we may have instantiated many other body literals before and the instantiation of these previous body literals is captured in the substitution sigma. And actually this is a ground substitution and ground substitution means that it maps all variables to ground terms, right? Or itself actually, because if a variable is not replaced, it is mapped to itself. But just as an anecdote on the side. Good, and then we have these, uh, the, we have the atom base. And keep in mind that in the atom base, we distinguish the set of, its subset, the distinguish of uh, atoms that were found to be true. And we will actually use these true atoms and the atom base uh, for simplifications that we do while instantiating a rule. Because keep in mind, in F we have atoms that are really true. In D we have atoms for which there is actually a derivation from the facts over the rules by neglecting or ignoring actually the negative body literals. And everything that is not in D does not have such a proof and is necessarily false. Okay, so this actually gives us quite some information that we can use for uh, well, either eliminating rules or, or, or compacting rules, uh, more or less as we've seen in the previous uh, section on on-the-fly subsumption. Okay, now when is actually such a match a member of the result of our function? So what constitutes a match of a body literal given the instantiations of the previous body literals captured by sigma, uh, as well as the atom base D along with its core of uh, true atoms that we have identified in the grounding procedure so far? Okay, such a match actually must extend, of course, and preserve the instantiation that we found so far, right? So if it is a match for our body literal, the substitution that we have gathered so far must be a subset of this. And keep in mind, here I treat a function as a set. So, I'm, so for instance, x is mapped to a and uh, y is mapped to b, right? And this is a set and this is more or less what I, why I use here a uh, subset relation to compare functions, right? So more or less the function has to extend the previous uh, substitution. Also, this should be done in a reasonable way. It should only uh, extended by the variables that are found in the current body literal and no more. And this is expressed by the second condition where I have to use again a footnote. And I guess this will become the slide of the footnotes. Anyway, I'm using this function vars in two ways. First, I apply it to uh, atoms or comparisons to give me all the variables that occur in this atom or this comparison. Also, I apply it to substitutions to give me all the variables that are mapped onto ground terms because all the others are mapped on themselves. Keep in mind, this is more as a notion of 
of substitution and unifications again. Check out Wikipedia if you want to know more. But anyway, I use this function here to say that, first of all, all the variables in the current body literals must be treated by our match. And also our match must not affect more than the variables in the current body literal and all the instantiation that have been gathered so far. So more or less, it should be well delim delimited uh, and it should only extend the instantiation gathered so far by mappings of the variables, by substitutions of the variables, variables that occur now in newly in the body literal B. Okay, good. Now, the remaining three bullets are simply uh, a case analysis. Now, the first, no, uh, the second bullet here is the case where our body literal is a comparison, the second one where it is a positive body literal, and the last one where it is a negative body literal. Now, in the first case, when our body literal is a comparison, we are only concerned that the uh, ground atom, the ground comparison that is obtained, is actually true. So if, let's say, if B was before X smaller than 3, and now our match substitutes x by 2, we get 2 smaller than 3, this is true, that's great, so this is a valid match. So more or less sigma prime uh, is, a, is a valid, is, is a match and should be returned by our procedure. Okay, the second case, here we have a, a positive body literal, this is, that is an atom, and keep in mind that the predicate symbol of B, unless it is recursive, has already been uh, instantiated before, so all the instances of it must belong to the uh, atom base. And this is actually what we check here, so we, we make sure that once we apply, so we have, we have let's, say, let's, let's, make it, let's say it this way, uh, sigma prime is a match for our body literal if once we apply it to the literal we get an atom that is already part of the atom base. And keep in mind, this makes sure that uh, the resulting ground atom has a derivation from the ground facts over the, over the rules by ignoring the negative body literals. If this condition does not hold, the atom must be false because there's, there's no derivation for it. And unless it is recursive, there will also be no other possibilities to derive the derivatives. We know it at this point, and hence this is, this, such a match is invalid. It would produce an atom that is never derivable. So here you actually you see nicely how how the atom base allows us actually to implement while grounding a part of the closed world assumption. At least we only ground atoms that are possibly true. We don't know it. They don't necessarily belong to F, to the true atoms among the atom base. But at least there should be a derivation from the facts over, over the rules ignoring the body, negative body literals. And this is guaranteed by our grounding procedure. Okay, that was a long explanation. Anyway. Uh, last point is what if our body literal is a negative one? That is here we have something like not A. Here we just do a sanity check. We make sure that the actual atom, once we apply uh, our match, does not belong to the true facts. So if this is the case, we know that this is still can still be made, become true, right? We leave it inside and this is also a valid match for a negative body literal. Okay, I think well, this was pretty technical, right? Uh, and oh, actually, you notice this that even my explanations had to had to double uh, go back and forth and so on, and so and so on and so forth. And so let's look at an example to make this clear or clearer. To illustrate this, let us look at this rather simple safe body order. And to see that it's safe, just note that the first occurrence of each variable in this sequence is within a positive body literal, right? X, this is the first occurrence of X, it occurs in a positive body literal. This is the first occurrence of Y, it occurs in a positive body literal. There are no more variables, so this is a safe body order. So now, we more or less simulate the grounding of the underlying body by working through this uh, sequence here from the left uh, to the right. And we do this in the context of this atom base here. Uh, and note actually that within this atom base we already found out that R3 uh, must be true in the previous grounding step. So we begin with the leftmost body literal, P of X, along with the empty substitution. And actually the empty substitution is not 
empty in the sense that it consists of substitutions of variables by themselves, but I will only give those substitutions where a variable is substituted by a ground term. And I zip it again. Anyway, let's look for matches of p of x. In fact, in our atom base, there's only one candidate, p of 1, hence we get a single match, which is replace x by 1. That's the substitution, that's the match that we get. There can be several ones, in case there were more ground atoms of uh, predicate p, but since they are not, we get a single one. The replacement of x by 1 is passed along when treating the second body literal qxy. But somehow with this substitution here, we are looking for matches of q1y because we already committed to 1 as a value for x. In our case, we find two candidates in, in our atom base, q of 1, 2 and q of 1, 3. And this gives rise to two extensions of our substitution. Right? So 1, we extend it with y replaced by 2 and the second one substitutes y by 3. In each case, we extend the substitution we gathered on the first uh, body literal. Okay, now that we have gathered two possible uh, matches, we have to treat each of them in turn. So let us proceed to the last but now negative body literal. For this we take uh, the first match uh, and keep in mind whenever we arrive at a negative uh, body literal all its variables must have already been bound beforehand uh, by the notion of a safe body order, right? So this is also the case here. So y has already been bound to 2 or substituted by 2. And the only thing that we do at that point, we do a sanity check, make sure that we don't create a match for uh, a literal that is already false. Well, in our case, uh, r of 2 uh, has not yet been found to be true, hence not r of 2 is still open uh, and hence this, uh, this, the match that we have now, x replace x by 1, replace y by 2, uh, is not yet refuted. It's a possible literal. We leave it in. Okay, and now we are done with our uh, body order. We have more or less uh, a, obtained a substitution that has, gone, has treated all the literals here in the, in the order and we get more or less as a body P, P of 1, Q of 1, two, 2, and not R of 2. So that's the first rule instantiation. And we would also need to instantiate now the hat, but this will be made precise when we look at the algorithm in a second. Okay, we're not so lucky with a, a second match, because here we substitute Y by 3, and for R of 3, we already know that it has been found to be true in previous grounding steps. Hence, since r of 3 is true, not r of 3 is false, there's no use in generating a match for this. Hence, here we terminate without producing a match in the end. And this does not yield to an instantiation of the body. Hence, there's no ground rule that is generated. Okay, and again, I hope this example here um, explained a bit better than I tried to do it, what a match is and how all this works. On the other hand, I really hope that you got the flavor of how a body order is used uh, to generate an instantiation of all variables in the body. And keep in mind, once we have uh, the positive body literals instantiated, the negatives are instantiated as well as the head. Hence, once we have the body instantiated, we can generate right away um, a ground rule by applying the substitution that we got the final match uh, to the whole rule uh, and then can output the rule. And this will be done in the algorithm that I will present to you next. Our rule instantiation function maps a single non-ground rule into a set of its ground instances. And well, this single non-ground rule is given as a lower r. And actually it does so by proceeding just as in the last example by following the safe order of its body literals b1 to bn. And again as before, as in doing so, it accumulates a substitution and each time more or less uh, the whole or well, one body order has been traversed, it applies this substitution to the non-ground rule and one ground instance of the rule is produced. Well, otherwise, well, as, as I already um, mentioned, 
small r is a parameter that gives us the non-ground rule. This guy won't change, that's, hence it's a parameter. And similarly, we have uh, uppercase r to distinguish its recursive negative body literals, because these guys need a special treatment, as we'll see in a sec. Then, as before, uppercase d represents the atom base. And again, this guy won't change, which is different from its true, uh, its, its subset of the of the true uh, atoms that we have already established, because these guys may grow while grounding. Because actually, we may start with the ground rule, and during instantiation, this may turn into a fact, and then we can actually add this fact to f to the part of the atom base that has already been established to be true. Okay, otherwise, the whole function uh, has two cases. So either we have walked through one body order, and then we assemble the rule in this part here, or in the else case, uh, we proceed along the body order and compute the matches that we have found so far. Okay, let's detail these two uh, parts one after the other. Now let's start with the else case, simply because when we start working our way through the body order, for each body literal, we will actually go in the else case and execute the code in there. And only when we have an empty sequence, when we have gone through the whole, through the whole body um, order, then we go into the then case. The other thing that is nice is uh, the way actually we walk through the body order reflects exactly the proceeding that we have done on the previous example. So, Imagine we call the, the whole procedure for the first time. We have here an empty substitution, and here we have a safe order of the body literals. Of course, since n is then usually, if there are body literals uh, greater than zero, we go in the else case. What we do then is we get a match, and this extends the, the, the former substitution. For the, and we do this, we get this match for the first body literal. We have it and then we take this match and look at the sequence that starts at the second body literal and goes all the way to the last one. Then we recursively call the procedure and we do this until we finally hit the empty sequence and then again we go in the then case. So you, you see actually that this involves quite some backtracking because at each, at each level uh, we look at all the matches. So we go down and, and uh, over the whole uh, sequence then we, if we're lucky, we, we, uh, we, we assemble a rule, we, we add the ground rule to our um, set of ground rules, which is actually the capital G here. Um, and then we go up one level, we go to the last but one body literal, we look at the next match if there is one, and keep in mind on the example we've seen that, right? Then we go, we, we take this match, go down again, see whether we get a ground rule, output it, and this will be backtrack our way through all these different uh, different levels until at the end uh, we we have at the we have no matches left and we output uh, output the set of ground rules. Note here that we do not only look at the ground rules of the single ground non ground uh, rule, but also uh, at the we also output the facts or the true atoms in the atom base, since they may uh, grow over time, uh, because we may actually find out that certain rules become facts, and then here, at this point, we actually augment the facts by the heads whenever a body is empty. But now I'm already anticipating the second case, which I wanted to explain to you separately. Let's do that now. Oh well, after all, our function is recursive. So while I've been explaining to you the else case before, this meant actually that I've been explaining to you the recursive step of the procedure. While now, in, do, in explaining you the then case, I explain to you the base step. So just for the record. Anyway, the base case is, 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 uh, is touched um, <laughs> when n equals zero, and this means that our function is called with an empty sequence. This also means that we have processed the whole safe body order uh, through the recursive steps and thus built a ground substitution sigma that when applied to the non-ground rule small r yields a ground rule. And this ground rule is here represented by r sigma. So where we apply the substitution sigma to the non-ground rule r and as a result we get a ground rule. Okay. Now, in the base case, what we more or less do, we assemble the, this ground rule. And here in the let case, we just assemble first the head and then the body. Now, let's first look at the head. That's 
pretty straightforward. So we look at the ground rule and we extract the head. Keep in mind that I use here the uppercase H to indicate that I want a singleton set because this is easier with set manipulations below, right? Okay, the body is a bit more complex, but I think also uh, uh, straightforward when you, when, you, when you look at it. So first of all, we here project the positive uh, body atoms out of the ground rules or the positive body literals, that's the same here, but we already subtract those that have been uh, found to be true, because why keep them in the rule? This is more or less an on-the-fly substitution. Now, the assembly of the negative uh, body is conditional, and is there we have to distinguish whether a negative body literal, and here we look at the non-ground one, belongs or is recursive, or whether it is not recursive. So if it is recursive, well, it may still be that it's still going to be derived either in the same component or a bit later, and we will have next immediately an example that illustrates that. So we cannot say actually, and so we would just produce here the, the ground version. Again, we just do, we take the non-ground negative literal, apply the substitution to the underlying atom, and then we put the negative literal back together. On the other hand, if this A does not belong to the recursive, um, uh, to the negative recursive uh, literals of the rule, then actually it cannot be produced later on. So somehow we at least check that the substitution is still possible, possible to derive because in case it would not be in D, we would already know that it is false and then we don't have to add the negation uh, of the atom, right? And again, an on-the-fly uh, simplification that we are doing here. So only more or less when we have a negative, non-recursive body literal that is among the possible, uh, the possible atoms where we don't know whether it would be true or false, we add the, 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 the negative body literal. Again, with the same trick that we apply the substitution to the non-round atom and then build, build the negative literal by cluing the not before. Okay, that were already almost too many words for this little thing. Good. Then once we have this, we check actually whether we, by simplification, right, because we, we actually removed a positive and negative body literals, whether we have obtained a fact by checking whether the overall body is empty. If it is empty, we add the head to uh, the fact. So this is actually where we augment the, 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 the atoms in the atom base that have been found to be true. And then, last but not least, we return uh, the, the ground rule that we obtained, provided that these two conditions hold, along with the facts here. Now let's check these conditions again. So first of all, the first condition checks whether the head already appears in the true atoms among the atom base. So if this is the case, we already know that H holds unconditionally, so we don't have to produce the rule, right? So, the, so no more or less H may not appear among the true atoms. This condition actually, uh, well, it, it makes sure, of course, that no negative uh, body literal is refuted, but actually when talking to R Roland, the builder of Gringo the Grounder, he reminded me that this condition is already built into the matches. But I thought I let it in because at least it makes clear that this condition here is also satisfied by the ground rule, that is, none of the uh, negative body literals is refuted. And perhaps this gives you some food for thought to work a little bit your way through that this condition could be dropped because it's already built in the matches. Okay, now that's the algorithm. Let's see it at work. Let us return to our Hamiltonian cycle example and look right away at the very first rule. Now this rule is interesting because it contains a recursive uh, atom and you may remember that in the algorithm we actually did a case analysis on a negative body literals where the atom is recursive or not. So the problem with recursion here is of course that when we are grounding this rule we have no clue about the instances of the path predicate because they are produced just when grounding the second component here in, uh, big, since they constitute the head of this rule. And this is basically the, the, the difficulty when you have a recursive atom. You have no clue about its instances because they may be about to produce when grounding the component, like here in the self-recursive case of, 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 of reach, or be produced in a later component as here where all these atoms are produced. Hence, you could not use these guys 
for simplifications um, because you do not know the set of instances. And again, I said this now three times, I'm so sorry. Anyway, uh, now that you got the overall picture, let's actually ground the first component and thus the, the very first rule here um, with the omit x, y if it is not on the path. So when grounding rule one, we are faced with the following situation. So here's our rule. Dependency analysis has identified path x, y as a recursive atom. And we have a set of uh, true atoms among the atoms in the atom base, uh, which are extracted from the problem instance, notably the facts in the problem instance. However, I will only give you here the instances of the predicate edge since they are relevant to our rule because the edge predicate occurs in it, but no others. Okay, now let's trace our rule instantiation function. So we call it initially with the empty substitution, the set of facts here, and a safe uh, body order that, that made us switch actually the two, the two literals in, in the original body. Okay, so this means we first have to find a match for the first um, for the first body literal here, this means, well, we have to find a substitution for x and y, and actually there are seven possibilities, right? Let, let's just take, uh, take the first one, that is we substitute x by a and y by b. Okay, we do this, then we call the procedure again recursively. Here is the match that we obtained. Uh, and now we reduced our body sequence to this one with a, with a single negative body literal. And keep in mind at that point, Whenever we see a negative body literal, we are sure that all its variables are bound, as in this case here, x to a and y to b. And the only thing we do now, we check whether path a, b is among the facts. This is not the case, hence this guy is okay. We can proceed. We get the empty sequence and this as the ultimate ground substitution. Ultimate ground substitution because now this substitution is, is used to build a ground rule from our non-ground rule. And obviously, we replace all variables occurring in the rule by, by values. But now we assemble the rules by making simplifications. And, well, the first thing that we do is when assembling the, the positive body literals, we eliminate all instances uh, where the instance, we eliminate all instances that are already contained in the facts. And, well, since we replace x by a, y by b, we get here edge a b this guy is already contained in the facts we already know that it is true so we, we can more or less take advantage of this knowledge eliminate this condition however for the negative body literals we have the case analysis and here we have a, a recursive we have a, a negative body literal over a recursive atom Hence, here we don't know which instances will be produced later on, so we don't touch them, we leave them intact, and of course then we, we add the head of it and we get uh, this ground rule here. So omit a, b if you have not selected it to be on the path. And here in this case we have not done anything to the, to the facts, and this is the result of this call. Now keep in mind when we actually looked at, at, the, at, at the matches here of edge, uh, x, y at the beginning, we have chosen a, b, but there are actually still six others. So let me abbreviate this, uh, this run here, this trace of the procedure in this way. So at the beginning, we, the match that we got yielded edge a, b. This is the first step. Then we had not path a, b. And then here in the, in, the, in the final step, in the termination case, we instantiated the rule. So by doing this, just to show you, to give you a, a summary of that, this was more or less the, the the first run that actually went over the whole uh, body order, but there are six others and all together we thus get seven uh, ground rules and they are all given here, more or less by iterating over the seven matches that we obtained originally for the edge predicate. Okay, so I hope this more, more or less brought you this uh, rule instantiation function a bit closer, but there are still some edge cases in the termination uh, condition that I would like to talk about before closing this section. So stay tuned! Now let us finally examine some corner cases of rule assembly. So to this end I have chosen a very simple rule that is even some more ground, right? And we don't have to bother about substitutions. Okay, this is our rule. A42 if not B52. And importantly, I'll be looking at this rule 
knowing that there are no recursive atoms. So notably B52 is non-recursive. Now what this actually means is that when grounding this rule, or when actually assembling the ground rule, um, we know all instances of predicate B and can react with on-the-fly simplifications to it. Hence, what I will be doing now is look at three cases depending on whether B52 is false, possible or true. And depending on these three cases, we will get different ground rules from this rule. Okay, now the first case is that B52 is regarded to be false because it just does not belong to the atom base. And keep in mind, we have seen all instances of, of B, so hence at that point we know it's not possible, it's impossible, it's false. Now, given that B52 is false, not B52 is true, hence we actually just get a fact, and that's what we return here. We return A42 as a fact, and now we have even learned that A42 is true, and we add it to the facts. Okay, this was the case where a negative, where the atom in a negative body literal uh, is false. Now let's make it possible. Possible means it occurs in the atom base, but has not found out to be true. So it's just possible. And at that point, actually, during grounding, we have no idea whether it's ultimately true or false, and this must be left to the solver, hence the rule remains intact and no simplifications are done to the body and also not to the whole rule. So the rule is uh, output, and of course the facts remain the same, there's not, nothing happening here. So finally, let's assume that we found out that B52 is true. This means we found out that it belongs to F, and since F is a subset of D, it must also belong to D. Now actually what happens is the atom of the negative body literal, B52, is true, hence not B52 is false, hence we can eliminate the whole rule, and here we don't even output a ground rule, we just output the empty set along with a set of facts. So I guess this nicely illustrated actually how we can play on the information given by the atom base depending whether atoms have been found out to be true, possible or false. And of course, normally we can't decide things and this is actually why we need the solver in the end. But in case we find out that an atom is true or false, we can do on the fly simplifications if we see it. But keep in mind, these guys are order dependent, so you must see it to do it. So if your order of the, of the components or whatever does not permit to, you to see it, you may not be able to do it, right? Okay, anyway, this was the first case. Now let's look at the second corner case. Our second corner case deals with a situation where as a human you would say, oh, this rule uh, is destroying all stable models, but the grounder can't see it. Okay, here's the example. So it's actually it's a self-conflicting rule. You can derive A42 if you cannot derive A42. And actually, simply by, by this rule here, A42 is recursive and all recursive atoms are protected from simplifications. Hence, you cannot simplify anything here and this rule here is obtained. And unless there is another rule that somehow allows you to derive A42, uh, this rule will destroy all stable models. Well, again, this is perhaps an artifact, but one has to be uh, also aware of such corner cases. And after all, the solver will, will decide such things. Because the grounder, again, just goes over the, 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 the program and tries to find out that something is true and false. But whenever something is recursive, you can't do simplifications. This has to be resolved ultimately by the solver. Okay, so this concludes uh, more or less uh, the section on ground or the part on grounding and so stay tuned for the end.